Angola has been at war with itself for more than 30 years. On a late Sunday afternoon, these girls in frilly dresses and boys in clean shirts could be mistaken for children from a normal world. Yet none of these children have ever known peace. The scars of war are everywhere. For most Angolans, the war around them has simply become a state of being. Hope is no longer a bearable option. It has been given and taken too many times. Nineteen ninety two is the year that hope died. For a few brief months, Angola held peace in its sights. A truce was called between the communist government of Eduardo dos Santos and the anti communist rebels of Jonas Savimbi. Sixteen years of brutal civil war came to an end. Savimbi brought his men out of the bush and back to the capital, Luanda. Elections were held, but then Savimbi claimed they were rigged and the war began all over again. As the bodies piled up in Luanda, Savimbi raised the flag of the black rooster over Wambo, Angola's second largest city. His fleeing men regrouped, and for more than a year, they were the kings of Wambo, Savimbi's beloved town. Then the government attacked the city. For 55 days, bombs rained down. Finally, UNITA was driven out of the city, but the siege had left 10,000 people dead, and the city of Huambo stripped, looted, and destroyed. Savimbi's former residence was once Huambo's most famous colonial home, but now it's simply Huambo's most famous ruin. Ever since the so-called Second War began again in 1992, it has been fought from the central highlands of Angola. The so-called Planalto is the heartland of UNITA. Savimbi was born here, and it's the home of his Obumbundu tribe. It's also the spiritual home of Savimbi's second war against Luanda. It's from here that he has steadily pushed the war outwards. Today, the vast rural areas of the provinces of Huambo, Bie, Moshiko, and Melange are UNITA territory. Only the capital cities have been left like islands in sea, still under government control. In this new war, Savimbi is true to his Maoist training. The strategy strangle the cities. Instead of wasting manpower trying to take the well-guarded capitals, UNITA is simply suffocating them. To get to the besieged cities across the interior of Angola, planes have to dodge surface-to-air missiles, they do this by flying at extremely high altitudes and then literally spiraling in over the relative safety of the cities. Kwambo has become a symbol of the new war in Angola. It was here that two United Nations aeroplanes were shot down by UNITA at the beginning of the year. These attacks marked the beginning of UNITA's new siege of the city as well as its scorched earth policy in the rural areas. For those seeking a front line to the war, this is it. The bombed out, destroyed, besieged capital cities are the end of the line for the thousands and thousands of people fleeing the war in the provinces. Now these cities are under government control. The areas surrounding the capitals are under UNITA control. And many argue that UNITA has purposefully created centers of crisis that will keep the government busy while they get on with war in the provinces. In 1992, the heart of Huambo was ripped out. The Portuguese called it Nova Lisboa, New Lisbon. It was meant to become the capital of all Portuguese colonies in Africa. Now there's nothing left of that colonial splendor. Huambo is a ghost of its former self. It has no running water, no shops, no hotels, no libraries, electricity for a few hours a day. Those people with enough money to leave have left the safety of Luanda. Huambo is now little more than a refugee center, 
and a garrison town defended by 15,000 government soldiers. One senses that holding on to Huambo has become a matter of pride for the armed forces of Angola. Yet the army is only able to hold on to a relatively small security perimeter of about 60 kilometers around the city. In the past six months, 80,000 refugees have flooded the city. They have left behind them their villages, their harvests, usually arriving with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. In what was once the industrial heart of Angola's second largest city, 18,000 refugees are crammed together in buildings that once produced goods. Instead today, they form the backdrop for food handouts. This airlifted food is the only thing standing between the people of Huambo and starvation. The roads leading out of Huambo are mined, bridges have been blown up, and Unita ambushes are a constant danger. A partir de janeiro. Sim, o que aconteceu? Matar pessoas, uhum. roubar a comida, roubar gados, cabritos, porcos, galinhas, roupa. E manda. E panelas. Então ficaram sem nada? Sem nada. Milho, batata. E até hoje estamos simples. Não temos nada para alimentarmos. Por isso que nós viemos daqui. Somewhere on the horizon lie the Unita guerrillas. Their presence is a cloud over life in the city. People constantly watch and wait for the next bombardment, the next attack, the next infiltration. They are guarded by reluctant young conscripts who know that Unita is out there, well hidden in the countryside around them. When the attack comes, it is sudden, but never unexpected. The residents can't even muster enough enthusiasm to show real terror. They run, but almost without respect for the shells that fly into their city. Twenty kilometers from Kwambo, a battle is raging for control of the strategic town of Kaala. It lies within the government's security perimeter. In the early hours of the morning, 1,000 UNITA guerrillas attempt to take the town. By the time the cameras arrive, the government troops have repelled the attack. And for an army that has been on the defensive for months, the relatively small victory in Kaala is something to celebrate. Bodies are shown and prisoners paraded. But the true pathos of civil war is this bundle of scattered milis, the rations of a young man who became a bush gorilla. War demands false bravado from young men. These young rookies understand that victory simply means they forced to remain standing for the next round. And on the other side of Huambo City, the soldiers who have not remained standing gather at a Red Cross hospital to replace the limbs they lost in battle. All four of these young men are conscripts. All four of them have lost their legs since the war intensified in January. The youngest, Antonio, is still completely shell-shocked. The other soldiers laugh at his detached behavior and strange speech. We were on patrol, he says. 
They told us to stop those people who are attacking the convoys. We were hungry, hungry, and then we went to find some food and some smokes. He gets a strange look in his eyes as he remembers how tired he was. We walked and walked and walked, and then I fell on a landmine. Some estimate that Angola has 10 million landmines buried beneath its soil in the three decades of war. For all those Angolans who have and still will step on landmines, the war will leave its terrible mark forever. Two hundred kilometers east of Huambo, over the vast UNITA-controlled BA province, lies the other strategic capital of the Central Highlands, Quito, another isolated, besieged city. It has been called Angola's Dresden because of the devastating damage it suffered in the Battle of 1992. 50,000 people lost their lives in the street fighting that finally drove UNITA from the city. During the siege of 1992, the city ran out of place to bury its dead, and bodies were buried on traffic islands and pavements. Today, Quito is a sad, humiliated city, haunted by the horrific memories of 1992. Most of those who had the means to leave the city have long gone. But their places have been taken by a deluge of refugees fleeing UNITA's war. 70,000 people have come to Quito in the past six months alone. Here in Quito, the full scale of the human disaster is becoming only too obvious. Quito is basically a besieged city uh, and the people do not have access to any land or any area whatsoever more than the radius of 15 kilometers or 30 kilometers in some directions and uh, whatever harvest people had available to themselves is, has already been used in the two months in March and April uh, because nobody could get food into this place. In a country rich with oil and diamonds food has now become the most precious commodity. The World Food Program is the only source of food for refugees spread out across Angola. Now even those supplies are running out. And to make matters worse, they are also running out of money to pay for the airlifts of food into the besieged cities. The security situation, it's already bad. If it gets worse, people will just start dying on the streets. And the situation is going to get worse in the next one month or so because the people have no access to food whatsoever. Savimbi has always referred to Angola's capital city as Luanda Landia, the land of Luanda. And in this civil war, the city could almost be another country. It carries none of the harsh battle wounds so many of the other cities and towns do. Luanda is the undisputed other side, the city of government. Along with a strip of coastal towns like Lubito and Benguela, Luanda is the one part of Angola that is still firmly under government control. It's from Luanda that the government runs its campaign to win over public opinion. A slick operation headed by a Brazilian public relations firm. Under the heading, Angola says enough, the advertisements are flighted on state television. Filled with images of happy people and well-equipped soldiers, this campaign tries to convince a cynical people that this war against Savimbi is worth fighting for. And with the campaign to win the hearts and minds of Angolans, the television campaign is also about fingering Savimbi as the country's prime perpetrator. Por três vezes, Angola estendeu a mão à paz e foi traída por Jonas Savimbi. Este homem, sem palavra, só assina acordos de paz para ganhar tempo, escondendo a sua verdadeira intenção. Angola diz basta! Angola vai vencer! Effective propaganda is an important instrument of war. In Angola, both sides are eager to show their war bounty and body counts. 
For ordinary observers, it's become virtually impossible to separate the reality from the spin doctrine. These are UNITA visuals of the aftermath of the March and April battles between UNITA and government forces in the Central Highlands. The footage is from a video smuggled out of the country, a disturbingly different picture to the official version seen by Angolans on their television screens. The government has promised that it will launch a major military offensive against UNITA before the rainy season begins in September. In March, the Angolan army tried unsuccessfully to take the UNITA stronghold of Bailundu in the Central Highlands. They came close, but UNITA's resistance was much stronger than expected and the army took heavy losses. In a country at war, images like these are carefully controlled. This could be mistaken for a victorious army in action, whereas in fact the army has publicly admitted that UNITA currently holds the military upper hand. The Angolan armed forces are stretched for resources. The state is practically bankrupt and there have been delays in raising the money to pay for new armaments. The most immediate problem, however, is manpower. With many of its best soldiers at war in the Congo and a continually expanding front at home, the Angolan army is desperate for more men. The government recently launched an aggressive conscription campaign in the run-up to the planned new offensive against UNITA. So far, it seems to have failed dismally with many youngsters desperate to stay out of the war. There are reports that the elite have sent their sons out of the country to save them from the front. But poor people like those in this neighborhood are not so lucky. All over the city we heard of forceful new tactics to boost the size of the army. The government has taken to cordoning off certain neighborhoods without warning and checking the papers of all men entering and leaving the area. Those who find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time are press ganged into service, even the very young or those who have served in the army before. Reliable information on the war is hard to come by in Luanda. The media is dominated by the state broadcaster and official newspapers. And in an atmosphere of severe restriction, most journalists do not even pretend to be unbiased. In Luanda, there is genuine fear of being branded as an informer or a UNITA sympathizer. But this little newspaper, with the curious title of Page 8, is one of the few sources of alternative information. We approached the editor for an opinion on what Angolans expect of the months to come. I think at this moment UNITA's strategy is to suffocate the big cities, to create a climate of unhappiness in the cities and areas controlled by the government. Thereby forcing the population from the rural areas to flee to the cities. They are blocking the roads, cutting the supply of electricity and maybe all this in order to force the government to sit down again at the negotiating table. As grandes cidades para pressionar o governo, se calhar, a sentar-se de novo à mesa de negociações. Eu penso que. I think the big offensive is still going to take place, that the government is preparing for that now. But this will not put an end to the Angolan conflict, because the offensive will just occur in some areas that are now occupied by UNITA. Angolano. Portanto, essa grande ofensiva poderá. As a military strategy, it's not worth much. It might have symbolic or historical value, but there's no strategic value in the big offensive.
While the talk of political solutions and a new offensive against UNITA might occupy journalists and politicians, the people at the beach bars and Sunday markets of Luanda are not waiting with bated breath. Here in the capital city, the edges of war are softened by a sense that life goes on. But across Angola, thousands of young men are losing their lives in a battle most of them don't want to fight. At the same time, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Angolans face possible starvation this year. And that is the true tragedy of Angola. It is one of Africa's richest, yet its people are forced into poverty. 38% of the budget is used to fund the war, while much of the rest is hijacked by the elite. For ordinary Angolans, peace is as elusive now as it has been for the past 30 years. Uh,